It feels a little weird to be reviewing Grindhouse because I would have preferred to have reviewed more of the films from Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino before I got here, but I don't know why I guess this is the year that I'm trying to do anniversary reviews. And I'm a few months late, but I had a lot of stuff to do, a lot of reviews to get through. And for those who don't know, um, the movie Grindhouse by Robert Rodriguez and Quinn Tarantino turned 10 years old this year in April. For anyone who doesn't remember and given how a lot of young people are today, I know I'm young but I think I'm a little different than most. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people didn't remember Grindhouse. For anyone who doesn't remember, Grindhouse was Robert Rodriguez and Quinn Tarantino's attempt to recreate the double feature drive-in experience from the 1970s and the two of them made their own um, choppy, schlocky um, exploitation films that they released together as one big film, Grindhouse. This is a, one of the rare DVD copies of the film that has the original release version. Almost all releases of it since then have been the movies, the two movies they made on their own. Robert Rodriguez made Planet Terror and Quentin Tarantino made Death Proof. And most often the DVD releases are the extended unrated versions, which are a bit more, I guess, well edited than the versions that were in Grindhouse, which were intentionally choppy to recreate the feel. Grindhouse brings a lot of nostalgia for me because to be clear, I did not see this movie when it first came out in the theaters. I was 12 at the time, and there is no way my mom would have allowed me to go. But I remember seeing trailers for it on all the um, channels, and just looked like a crazy, wild movie that, I just, that my 12-year-old brain was just like, oh, I hope I see this someday. And then I finally did. I got the DVD around when I was um, 14 or 15, 16, I can't remember. My brain's a little fuzzy with that point in my life and I sat down in the dark on my, using my big TV and watched the whole thing in one sitting and it was fucking glorious. And uh, as anyone watching can clearly tell, I am too young to have experience the true Grindhouse um, double feature experience from so long ago. But I immerse myself in a lot of the exploitation films and do a lot of research on that era of movies and I love Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino to death so I understand what this movie's doing and I really get it and I have a great blast with just uh, every time I watch it. And for the month of June, I thought I'd review this movie in parts. Today's review is going to be for Planet Terror by Robert Rodriguez. And to give Grindhouse the true double feature feeling, 
there were fake trailers made for very grindhousey looking films, most of which never got made into real movies. There were one or two that did, but they made them specifically for the three hour double feature version, and the first fake trailer was made by Robert Rodriguez himself, and that trailer was one of the few that became its own movie. Machete, starring Danny Trejo. And the fake machete trailer that spawned the actual film is so awesome you can see exactly why they made it into its own movie. Just looks like balls to the walls, crazy, very uh, exploitive, very violent. Looks like a ton of fun, and of course, it's Danny fucking Trejo. He is awesome, and the idea that he finally got his own starring role was just uh, so cool. And a lot of the footage in the trailer um, made it into the final film, and, and according to Robert Rodriguez, he claims that a good chunk of the 2010 full, full film Machete was actually filmed when he made the fake trailer. And you can see, like, there's a lot of shots here that are in the movie. There's a lot of scenes that use certain parts, like certain shots have been were redone. And they also recast certain actors for certain shots for the finished film. But they definitely reuse a lot of the same stuff. And, and I actually saw the 2010 version of Machete before I saw Grindhouse. Saw the fake trailer that became the actual film. And I don't know what to say other than the actual movie lived up to the fake trailer. An exploitation film showing the one Mexican you don't want to fuck with. One major difference is, unlike the fake trailer says, the actual movie was not rated X. Machete. Rated X. Just so cool, like this character that was originally a supporting character in the Spy Kids movies became the leading role in his own um, heavy R-rated um, action flick. It's just cool. And the last thing I'll say is the only actors who carried on from the fake trailer to the actual Machete movie were obviously Danny Trejo and Cheech Marin as Machete's priest brother and a scene in the trailer that made it into the finished film which is just a great badass scene is where Cheech Marin's priest is holding a henchman at gunpoint with a shotgun, and the henchman's like, Please, Father, have mercy! And Cheech Marin... I don't think Cheech Marin has ever been had a chance to play a badass before in this. He goes, God has mercy. I don't. And... <laughs> head goes off. And also, um, just because he's too good to let up, Jeff Fai as the as one of the many villains in Machete. All right, enough gushing over the awesome fake trailer that became its own actual movie. Let's get into Planet Terror. Planet Terror is I don't know what to say other than that it is awesome. It is a kick-ass, uh, bloody fun ride, and Robert Rodriguez really knew how to create a cheap schlocky movie because kind of what he's been doing most of his career. Like, he's worked in low, in low budget a lot more than Quentin Tarantino, so he knows how to work with what you get and um, how to try and make something bigger than it actually is. Like, I'm pretty sure this movie had an actual budget, but Planet Terror definitely looks um, the schlockiest of the two main movies. And something that's pretty awesome is Rodriguez and Tarantino recreated um, a certain aspect of the drive-in experience, which is they had the whole screen of their movies um, looking pretty shitty, like the quality was pretty low, looked scratchy, which they... I think Tarantino probably um, messed up his own negatives to make him look like this, but Rodriguez, um, he shoots his movies digitally now. He's been shooting them that way since Spy Kids 2 and Once Upon a Time in Mexico, so he probably used some kind of software, but it is a pretty good scratchy look. There's lines everywhere, and there's um, blurs and bubbles appearing. Makes it look like the film is just a big mess. And something Rodriguez did that I thought was a very fun touch was 
he edits out like certain frames in between shots, like when characters like this and then zoom like that. Now I know a lot of action movies have kind of been doing that sort of thing, and often it comes off as annoying, but here where it's being tribute to low grade movies, I think it works very well. And it just it gives it a very hyper feel and Robert Rodriguez, like he does with most of his movies, takes on many jobs here. He's the writer, director, the cinematographer, editor, and this is the first, I think, for him. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time he's ever actually done the music to his own movie. And originally, I read this, originally, Robert Rodriguez um, tried to get John Carpenter, yeah, THE John Carpenter, to do the music score for Planet Terror. And I don't know why, but eventually he decided to do it himself. Maybe, and this is just uh, my theory, like, Rodriguez is a huge fan and admirer of John Carpenter's work, so maybe this was Rodriguez's um, own way of paying tribute to Carpenter, a guy who does the music for his own movies. It's just, a, it'd be a nice thought to think of that's why he did it, like, I'll get John Carpenter, you know what, I'll do it myself to show that I can do it too. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's a nice thought, and it would have been cool and interesting to see what it would have sounded like if John Carpenter had done the score, like, Carpenter has done music scoring for movies he didn't direct, um, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, but he doesn't, he hasn't really done it that often outside of his own film, so... That would have been very cool and interesting. Other members of the crew include Elizabeth Avalon, Robert Rodriguez's ex-wife, who, during and after their marriage, has produced all of his movies. Maybe one or two she hasn't, but I'm pretty sure she's produced almost all of his films. And also Rodriguez and Tarantino themselves. And the executive producers are Sandra Condito and... Tarantino's regular produce, executive producing buddies, Bob Weinstein and Harvey Weinstein. And a co-editor that worked with Robert Rodriguez on this film was Ethan Manikis. M-A-N-I-Q-U-I-S. Once again, I am fucking awful at pronouncing names. And the special effects makeup was done by the now legendary... Greg Nicotero, who many people probably know best as the makeup artist for The Walking Dead. He's also done the makeup work for a ton of Tarantino's films like Kill Bill and Django Unchained, and also Howard Berger, who also worked on Kill Bill and has actually won an Oscar. And before I move on to the plot, I just want to point out something that I think is pretty cool. I have an aunt who actually went to college with Greg Nicotero. I'm not kidding, she went to college with him and she told me that he dropped out to um, work with Tom Savini. I think it was for George A. Romero's Day of the Dead. I might be getting something wrong, but my aunt went to college with Greg Nicotero. She hasn't seen him since college, but it's pretty cool and I said to her, if I ever, um, meet him, I'll bring you up to him. See if he remembers. The plot for Planet Terror is, um, pretty simple and doesn't try to get too complex, at least until maybe the last 10 minutes, and just to be clear, I'm reviewing the 90-minute version that was featured in Grindhouse, not the unrated or extended cut, so I'm not gonna talk about any scenes that could be from that version. Planet Terror, um is about a group of um, locals in a Texas town. The movie is based in Texas, uh, Robert Rodriguez's home state, and next to Mexico is a place that he's very passionate about. The main group consists of a bitchy stripper named Cherry Darling, played by Rose McGowan, and her former lover, Ray, played by Freddy Rodriguez. No relation to Robert Rodriguez. And it's revealed that he used to go by the name El Rey. 
Marley Shelton as Dr. Dakota Block. Jeff Fahey, once again, great actor, as JT. The 80s legend, Michael Bain as Sheriff Haig, who is later turns out to be the brother of JT. They got a great cast here. So many, um, people that are both from the early 2000s and the 1980s, 1970s, and Michael Bain especially, he is a great character actor. Like, people know him best from The Terminator and James Cameron's Aliens, and possibly um, from The Rock. He had a supporting role in that film. And I'm not saying his career has not been good. He's been in a ton of stuff. But um, he was in so many great films, and he had such great roles that... And I'm kind of surprised he didn't become a bigger name. He does pretty well in the roles he's been given. He, he acts in action movies and thrillers very well, and has a great presence. And even when he's playing an asshole, Michael Bain generally is pretty likable. But anyway, back to the plot. All these people live in a town in Texas where an epidemic has started, where people are very easily becoming infected, and this whatever is infecting them causes their skin to boil and rot. And then it eventually turns out that this uh, disease turns people into zombies. Oh yeah, Robert Rodriguez doing a zombie movie. Makes sense. He's done vampires, aliens, What's next but fucking zombies? And the zombies in Planet Terror are pretty awesome. They move a little too fast for my for what I usually prefer, but it doesn't bug me too much, and they look awesome, and the scenes where they are ripping people to shreds and eating them, and just uh, slaughtering over and over, are just so fucking badass and so cool to watch. The gore effects in Planet Terror are amazing, and... Just a, just a warning for anyone who wants to go see Planet Terror, don't go in with a full fucking stomach, because there's some pretty nasty shit here, and I, I don't just mean the zombie stuff. We see Marley Shelton's character, Dr. Dakota Block, at a hospital where she works with her possibly abusive husband, Dr. William Block, played by Josh Brolin, and... We see some people who have the disease, and there's a scene where they display, like, people with rotting, uh, diseases on a computer to try and figure out what's wrong with everybody. And we see this graphic shot of somebody, this guy who has, like, a rotted genitals, like he's missing his penis, and the doctor graphically says, Whenever he peed, it would come out these holes like a fountain. Ugh. We get this uh, pretty funny but grisly scene where Josh Brolin's character is almost sawed in half by a zombie who gets hold of a buzz saw, but the plug falls out. So what the zombie does, it squeezes the pussy blood goo on its face and just wipes it on Brolin. He's like, oh, oh, oh. it's just nasty and awesome. So it's just so gory. Brilliant. The grossest moment for me, personally, was when Brolin's character um, sees somebody with a uh, swollen tongue that has all these raw-looking bumps on it. It is nasty. And he squeezes one of these bumps, and it pops like a pimple. And anyone who's ever had to pop a very bad zit, you know, where the pus just shoots out, this scene is uh, going to bring back bad memories, and it lands on his glasses, and that's another thing to point out. Like, next to the worst-run prison in El Mariachi, Planet Terror features possibly the most unhygienic doctor in film history. Like, Brolin's character, like, he's handling a lot of this stuff and touching a bunch of these people who are infected, all the while um, touching himself. Without any fucking gloves. And Josh Brolin, by the way, he is a great uh, sleazy and just possibly um, psychotic villain. And the zombie infection doesn't really do much to 
help those around him. Like it just makes him more. It doesn't stop him from being a evil, abusive asshole. And like he finds out that his wife, Doctor Dakota, has been cheating on him um, with a woman, who is played by like Stacy Ferguson, aka Fergie. And not much to her performance other than that her character ends up getting uh, eaten by zombies. And when they bring her in, they go, looks like a no-brainer. What do you mean? And then they turn her over, showing the back of her head, which is open. And they go, brain's been scooped out clean. It's a, it's a grisly funny moment. A big theme of uh, both Planet Terror and Death Proof, I think it was explored a little better in Death Proof, is the idea of um, these female characters uh, being abused and then um, becoming strong and fighting back and just kicking major ass. And not just to the people who abuse them, but of course to the zombies around them. I mean, there's no zombies in Death Proof, but the th theme of uh, abused women uh, fighting back against the abusers is a theme, and I think both movies did it pretty well. Rose McGowan as Sherry, Cherry, <laughs> Darling, um, she's a, go she's a stripper, and she adamantly will go, 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 dancer. And for the most part, um, she plays her character as kind of a uh, very um, abrasive uh, bitch. But she kind of has some reason for the way she acts, but after a while it kind of gets a little grating, but luckily around halfway into the movie, her character starts to grow, and um, she's not as um, hard to like in the, as the film goes on. She, Rose McGowan did a very good job with um, playing a complex character that um, progresses over the film. If I seem a little hyper, it's because I overslept and... I need my Irish coffee. <sighs> the most well-known thing about Planet Terror and Grindhouse would be Rose McGowan's uh, portrayal as a badass stripper who loses her leg in the um, zombie uh, epidemic, like zombies rip it off. And at first she has kind of a peg leg. It, it has, there's some funny physical humor in there. And in the last 20 minutes of the film, she gets an upgrade. She gets a machine gun peg leg, both to help her walk, but also to fire and just shoot all the zombies. It's, it, it is ridiculous and retarded in all the best ways possible. It is just so cool and awesome to watch. And, and we get this amazing moment where Cherry is walking with her machine gun leg. And there's a rocket launcher on it. And she uses the rocket launcher to blast into the air. And as she flies through the air, looking badass and hot, she unloads a array of bullets hitting the zombies one by one. That is fucking awesome. And if you try to tell me it's not, you can, but I'm not sure we're gonna reach any common ground. And a fun supporting actor to know about is the Blocks have a son named Tony who is played by Robert Rodriguez's own son, uh, Rebel Rodriguez. And, uh, I'm not sure how to describe this kid. I mean, Robert Rodriguez, um, he, he tried and he set out to make his son be the, um, creepy little kid that you see in a horror movie, and I'd say he succeeded. I mean, like, he looks normal enough, but... It's the way he talks, and he's not a bad actor. Like, he is supposed to be a weird kid, but damn, is he a weird kid in this. And a lot of it just has to do with the way he talks, which is just so unnerving in a way. It just doesn't sound right. And we get a very chilling scene in this, which I admit is one of the most, um, 
chilling moments in the movie. So chilling that Robert Rodriguez was very disturbed while filming it. Like, it really uh, unnerved him to do this scene. Dr. Dakota is desperate after her husband tries to kill her after finding out that she's been having an affair with Fergie. And uh, she goes to her father, who she's estranged from, and I don't know why, and this character, even though her husband is a crazy and possibly abusive asshole, this character is really fucking stupid in most of her decisions. To the point where, like, she is going to her father during a zombie epidemic and instead of bringing her son with her, having him at her side to make sure he's safe, what does she do? She leaves him in the car with a loaded gun, telling him to shoot anybody that comes by in the face, and he's like, what about dad? And then she's like, especially your father. She gets out, and she tells him to be careful where he points that gun, and she doesn't make it halfway to the house before hearing a gunshot go off, and... No surprise, the fucking kid shot himself. Now, I'm pretty sure it was an accident, but... I just sit here, and... I'm thinking, why didn't you take him with you? I mean, yes, there's zombies around, but there were no zombies at that particular moment, and... You would have made sure he didn't blow his own fucking head off. And then Josh Brolin's character, who is partially infected at this point, shows up and she grabs the kid and screams, Look what you did to our son! And I'm sitting here thinking, Uh, that one's on you, bitch. You're the one that left him with a loaded gun instead of taking him with you. I know I'm saying that a lot, but... God damn! And Robert Rodriguez said that he found it so chilling to film this scene that the reason he cast his own son was he didn't want to have to put another parent through um, the idea of having to see their kid uh, fucking shoot their brains out. And as he put it, it didn't feel so bad about killing a kid since it was his own kid. Um, interesting deduction of logic there, Rodriguez. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know what to make of that. And for, it was all in good fun, I'm sure. And according to Robert, just because um, he doesn't want, he didn't want his son at the time, who was like 7 or 10, to see himself die, he says he made an alternate cut of Planet Terror. And I did see footage from this in like a special behind the scenes thing, where the Tony character does live throughout the movie. And as far as I can tell, that version is not um, available to the public. It's entirely uh, in Robert Rodriguez's possession, and it sounds more like it was just for the family, and that part is touching, but the whole, I feel more comfortable killing a kid if it's my own. <laughs> uh, uh. Something I do think is kind of cool about the Tony character is... He has a pet tarantula. He, uh, he also has a pet turtle and a pet scorpion, but it's mainly to the tarantula that I think is kind of cool. Like, I don't think I've ever said this before, but when I was a kid, I actually had a couple of pets. Um, I had a, f a bunch of fish, I had a lizard, and um, I did have a tarantula at one point. In fact, I had two tarantulas when I was a young kid. I never held my tarantulas the way this kid does. He's letting them crawl over himself. Because, uh, I don't know, maybe I was a pussy, or maybe my family was pussies and they didn't want to risk anything. But yeah, I had two tarantulas. They were in cages, and um, I think they were good spiders overall. Aside from Josh Brolin as Dr. William Block, um, other villains, I guess, this film could have are the military, who we find out are responsible for the virus that, um, is killing everybody. And 
the military, the soldiers who are responsible. They've been infected to a point where they need a special gas that they have to breathe in to avoid the infection spreading, and the leader, named Lieutenant Muldoon, is played by none other than Bruce Willis. And this is back in a time where Bruce Willis actually gave a shit about the movies he made, so... Yeah, this is a fun version of Bruce Willis that I like to see. And I think Bruce Willis has a very strong uh, working relationship with Robert Rodriguez, at least in all the movies that I've seen him in that were directed by Rodriguez. Willis has always done well, and he's always talked very favorably about Rodriguez as a director. Here he plays yeah, um, the leader of the evil military group, and... Willis's role, I read, was kind of meant to be a tribute to low-budget grindhouse films that would get a big-name actor or someone who was a big-name actor and kind of at the end of their heyday, and they would um, cast them in a role that would usually be shot in one or a few days, usually just one day, and then they would uh, market the hell out of their name for the movie even though they are in very little of the film, and sometimes their scenes are spliced in so lazily that it didn't make sense. It does make sense here, and um, Willis is pretty fun in his villainous role. Like, Bruce Willis can, has proven that he could be a very good, effective villain. And his most memorable line is, Where's the shit? Referring to the gas that, um, prevents the soldiers from becoming zombies. And this biochemist scientist, I forget exactly what he's called, who I think is either responsible for the gas or the antidote, named Abby. He's kind of a villain. I mean, he does horrible shit, and it's only when the military turns on him that he starts working with our group of more heroic characters. But, um, yeah, he, he fluctuates between being a villain and an anti-type hero. I mean, his, this character, Abby, is a pretty sick motherfucker. Like, if somebody fucks up or if he takes down an enemy, he... I'm not joking. Remember, this is meant to be a wild, crazy, uh, gory mess of a movie. The Abby character, um will castrate his enemies or failed comrades, and he will put their severed testicles in a jar. It's pretty nasty. Like, I know I've seen nasty a lot, but what else can you say about that? And we get this funny scene, I guess, of him getting a little comeuppance, where his jar of uh, cut-off balls drops, and all the severed testicles go everywhere, and he collapses with his face squishing into them. He's like, huh, 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 huh. And for some reason, he's really obsessed over keeping the balls of his enemies. Like, even though the jar is broken, he tries grabbing them and stuffing them in his pockets. Hmm, doesn't make a ton of sense, and, and just to be clear, this film is edited in a way where there's not a lot of establishment for some of the characters, and there's maybe a few plot holes, where you, or at least you feel like a good amount of the plot was cut out, and which it was. To like the unedited version is a lot longer, features more, I guess, dialogue-driven moments, which Rodriguez cut out to feel more choppy, and and for that reason, I believe it works. And um, going off track happens a lot. Uh, the Abby character, the fucked up scientist um, guy, is played by Naveen Andrews of Lost. Plays a good freaky cunt. And as for the supporting cast, Sheriff Haig has two deputies named Deputy Tolo, played by the great legendary Tom Savini. 
Tom Savini did not work on the makeup for this film. I think he's pretty much been retired from the hands-on makeup business for I've almost 20 years at this point. But here he's an actor, and he has a good job playing a blubbering uh, wimp who at one point gets his finger, ring finger, bitten off by the zombies. And he finds his wedding ring and nowhere else to put it, puts it on his middle finger. The other deputy who gets killed off pretty quickly is Deputy Carlos, played by the star of Robert Rodriguez's very first film, Carlos Gallardo, the original El Mariachi. Other members of the supporting cast include Skip Rising as Skip, the runner of the strip club uh, that Cherry works at in the opening scene. Which, by the way, is a excellently shot and well-scored opening credit sequence. It's uh, Rose McGowan doing a strip um, number and um, her character, like, showing how she hates what she's doing, um, begins to cry near the end of it. And, well, the music really helps drive the scene to be more emotional than it has any right to be. But the Skip character has one of the most memorable lines in the film that uh, the Cherry character later uses against him to convince him to do the right thing, which is, it's go-go, not cry-cry. And we also get these two, um... I don't know what to call these characters. They're called the Crazy Babysitter Twins, played by actual twins Electra Avalon and Elise Avalon, played who are Elizabeth Avalon's um, real-life nieces. The Great Michael Parks. One of the coolest old men currently working in the movie business. Plays Earl McGraw. A reoccurring character in films by Rara Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. He made his first appearance in From Dust Till Dawn. And that was a pretty uh, cool role he had in that film. The Earl McGraw character was born and became a fan favorite, even though... even though Earl McGraw was fucking killed in that movie, and there was no way he could have survived it, like, Tarantino's character in that film shot him in the fucking brain. But, because he was so well-liked, they, um... I guess said, fuck continuity, and they brought him back for other movies. And I don't know if that's not to imply that all the other movies take place before From Dust Till Dawn. Doubtful, because in Planet Terror, it's practically the end of the world. Michael Parks is a ton of fun. He's awesome. He's uh, pretty badass, and he can play evil pretty well. He's not an evil character here, but I'm just trying to express his range. And he has two very memorable one-liners here, where he's feeding his catatonic wife in one scene, and he's like, Eat up, sugar. Gotta get you ready. Gotta get you... Oh, god damn! Woman, you fart like a goddamn pack mule. Wow! And later at the end of the movie... William Block appears one more time even worse and more infected, and he's about to kill Dakota, and then all of a sudden he is shot dead, and Dakota looks over and it's Earl McGraw, who, by the way, is Dakota Block's father. He's the one who she was estranged from, and it's implied it's because she married William Block, and Earl McGraw, after shooting his daughter's evil husband says, never like that son of a bitch. About as useless as a pecker on a pope. <laughs> Very funny. 
And now down to the last two actors who I believe are worth mentioning. There's a scene where all the main characters are captured by the um, evil military group and two soldiers in particular take um, Rose McGowan and Marley Shelton's characters and put them in a room where it's implied that they are keeping them there for when they or if they intend to uh, rape them. One of them, who is billed as Rapist Number One, is played by none other than Quentin Tarantino himself. He doesn't act that often, and I know Tarantino gets a lot of shit for his acting, but I don't think he's that bad as an actor. Um, he does well playing the roles he's given, which are usually pretty um, sleazy or slimy um, assholes. The other rapist, rapist number two, is played by, that's what they're billed as, and Tarantino talked about how Funny it is that that's his big role in the film, Rapist Number One. Quite a t quite a credit to go by. The other rapist is um, Gregory Kelly, a very, um, from what I see, looks like a very steroid jacked motherfucker. And we get this very memorable scene where Tarantino's rapist uh, forces Cherry to. Do a strip tease, even though she has a peg leg, and you really hate Tarantino's character in this scene. Like he is just horrible and just just so evil. And despite that, he does get a, a few funny lines, which uh, makes his um, inevitable death all the more um, satisfying. He says, "I've seen a lot of crazy things. I've seen me a stripper with nine toes." I've seen me a stripper with no brains, but I've never seen me a one-legged stripper, and I've been to Morocco. <laughs> anyway, um, despite that, this is a pretty emotional scene. He yells at Cherry, "Come on, break a leg!" and she swings her peg leg and literally breaks it in half across his face, and then paying tribute to. Lucio Fulci's Zombie 2. She shoves the tip of the peg right into Tarantino's eye. Breaks it off and we see a big splintery piece. And he's like, You gave me some wood, now I'm gonna give you some wood. And he drops his pants and everybody, including the other rapist, just uh, look horrified and gasp. And then Tarantino looks down and sees that his dick is literally melting and dripping off. And the other guy's like, What are you doing? Put your mask back on! Like, the gas that uh, prevents the soldiers from becoming zombies. And Tarantino, playing, doing a great job of playing an evil idiot, goes, No, fuck the gas! I'll just make this quick. And... <laughs> As he's walking towards um, Cherry, we see his dicks. It stops looking like a dick and looks more like tentacles just dripping from his crotch. And then Marley Shelton takes out this kind of a syringe gun thing. And he, he stopped questioning where they're getting this shit. And she shoots Tarantino in the eye, which causes his mutation to get even worse. And then, um,. Ray comes in and gives Sherry... Cherry... My bad. He gives her uh, the machine gun leg. She busts open the door to the room they're locked in by uh, shooting it, but also shooting like the rocket front launcher from the rig. Um, the first thing that gets hit is Tarantino's rapist character right in the crotch, and it goes through him, flips him, and busts the door open and just... BAM! And she fires down the other rapist soldiers, and then hearing the uh, this radio that was playing the music for her one-legged dance still playing, she slips the leg up and poof, blows it up. Like I said, this movie is ridiculous and retarded in all the right ways. 
And before I forget, I just want to address two very strong character moments. Um, the El Rey character is an awesome character. He's very badass. He's a great fighter, and Ray and Cherry are a very good uh, team together, and eventually a very good couple. And even though Cherry's a bit antagonistic towards them, and they don't get along for the first half of the movie, when they do um, get along, it feels genuinely sweet. And we get this uh, actually pretty um, stylistic, um, very hot sex scene between them. And it's implied, and mainly as a joke for the uh, theatrical version, that their sex was so hot that the film's projector couldn't take it, and the film reel um, boils up. And then we get this title card saying, Missing real. And then we cut to a scene that seems like it should have had an additional uh, 10 minutes of building up. And we have characters refer to shit that we didn't get to see. Corda Rodriguez and Tarantino, this is a. Uh, was inspired by a moment where Tarantino was watching a cut of a movie he owned where um, an entire reel was missing. And for this particular cut that he had, just a card saying missing reel was put in to explain whatever happened. And uh, it's pretty funny here. And the only other strong character driven part of the film is the relationship between the brothers JT and Sheriff Haig, where you get the feeling they don't get along too well, but there's a brotherly connection there. And at the end of the film, JT and Sheriff Haig are shot and dying, and they say they'll stay behind and blow up the military base so everybody can get away. And even though they're dying, they jokingly talk about opening a new barbecue shack together. JT was running a shack early in the film, which he kept saying, and the best ribs are best barbecue in Texas. And before El Rey left them with the explosives, he said, El Rey said to JT that his brother's the best, to which he went, best in Texas. And during their final scene, JT finally tells his brother the recipe for the barbecue sauce that he makes, and he tells him, you gotta hold this to your grave. And he says, as he dies, I can do that. And then he dies. And JT, holding his brother, cries a little, and then holds up the detonator, and laughs, knowing that while they may die, the people responsible for this are fucked. It's a good family moment. I liked it. Okay, let's wrap this fucking review up. Right before Fergie's character is killed, we hear on the radio them talking about the passing of someone named Jungle Julia, who is one of the main characters in Death Proof. I will get into this when I review Death Proof. And the last fact to know is that during the initial release, audiences were reportedly walking out of the three-hour Grindhouse movie after Planet Terror because, and the theory was that a lot of people were too young to remember the Grindhouse era or to know about it. And I, I'm supposing, yeah, like, probably didn't understand and, I mean, I'm, I don't know what to say or then, I am, uh, I was younger than probably a lot of people who went to see Grindhouse when I finally saw it. I knew about Grindhouse, so what the fuck, people. Oh boy, I am tired, and I've had alcohol, so it's 
going to be hard for me to um, speak coherently. <sighs> yeah. I don't know what else to say, but Grindhouse is a awesome uh, movie, and I'm going to continue reviewing it next week where you're for part two. I'm not going to do death proof. I'm going to review the fake trailers that were in between the two movies, and, and it will be the week after that that I review death proof for part three, just so people kind of know my game plan. I feel this is a uh, good place to end off, and the very last thing I'll say is the ending to Point of Terror is, when you've seen it, you'll understand what I mean. It's very touching. <laughs>